Welcome to Midnight in America, your source for the most provocative global affairs content on the internet. This week's guest is author and photographer Dan Garrett, who joins us to discuss China's tightening grip on Hong Kong. It's midnight in America, 2 p.m. in Sydney, Australia, high noon in Hong Kong. Dan Garrett, Dan Garrett, what time is it where you are? Hi, Sal. It's midnight in America. Here outside <laughs> so of Washington, you're joining DC. us not from Hong Kong, but from the U.S. Where are you? Um, I'm right outside location. Washington, D.C. right now. I'll be going back to Hong Kong uh, pretty soon. Yeah. So Washington, D.C. And why, what's your connection with Hong Kong? I mean, you know, you don't look like a Hong Kongese person to me. You don't sound like a Hong Kongese person. Well, uh, what's your Hong connection? Hong Kong is all sizes and shapes. Uh, most of them are smaller than me. Uh, shame, but, uh, shame on me as a sociologist. <laughs> Well, my first trip to Hong Kong was in 2000 when I was working in industry. And um, several trips after that, I fell in love with the city, the vibrance, the energy. Uh, it probably reminded me of lots of things from my past. Uh, and as I worked through my professional career, I had an opportunity to go do a fellowship there uh, with uh -huh. the Office of Director of National Intelligence, an unclassified fellowship. And at that time, I decided that a uh, pursuit in academia was uh, viable option for me and uh, that the Hong Kong and one country two systems question was something that was very challenging intellectually and would be there for the next 30 or 40 years. So uh, in 2011 when I retired from the US government I began my PhD studies at uh -huh. City University of Hong Kong okay. and um, that was in applied sociology. And can I ask, so you mentioned several times you used to work in industry for the government can we tell well, people what sort of industry you were in? Well, I worked in industry and then I also worked in government. So I was oh, okay. in and out. So when I was in industry, I worked in uh, information technology, security, uh, like cybersecurity type things, also technology forecasting, uh, wireless broadband. Um, when I was in the government, I was an intelligence analyst for most of my time. And when I retired from a defense intelligence agency in 2011, I was the uh, chief of strategic and technical threats branch looking at uh, threats to the United States. Oh, wow. So we, we're going to resist the temptation then to ask you about Russian uh, election hacking, <laughs> which I'm going <laughs> quite a thank bit. You, thank you, because that was old school back in the 90s, and it's kind of like <laughs> history repeats itself. <laughs> oh, and, and, it's, and it's said, let's focus on your Hong Kong experiences, because, of course, you did a PhD. Uh, and it, it's on, if I remember right, it's on the Umbrella Movement, but it's not really... Well, first of all, why don't you tell people what the Umbrella Movement is, and then you can tell me that your thesis isn't really on the Umbrella Movement <laughs> as such. Well, the Umbrella Movement is uh, much more complicated than what it is commonly presented as. Uh, in short, um, it was a 79-day movement uh, in Hong Kong from uh, September 28th, uh, through about the middle of December, and it was um, Hong Kongers' demands for universal suffrage. But it was also a response to the Hong Kong government uh, excessive use of force, tear gassing uh, peaceful demonstrators, um, and re several repeated instances of uh, pro-regime violence on the students. Right. Um, the predecessor to that was the Occupy Central with Love and Peace Movement, was a, which was a universal suffrage movement which had started uh, the beginning of 2013. So oh, are those separate? 18 month, yes, they're separate, oh, okay. although they're commonly put together. Right. The Occupy Central Movement was a civil disobedience movement, and the Umbrella Movement is frequently put in the civil di disobedience frame, but right. parts of it was actually more of a political disobedience move. So even though the Umbrella Movement is used to capture lots of different parties and actors inside the movement. Uh, you had three major occupation camps, one on Hon uh, two on Hong Kong Island at Admiralty and Causeway, up Causeway Bay, and then one on Mong Kok. And each of the camps had their own different personalities and different political interests in it. But what was common to all of them was the fight for Hong Kong, to defend Hong Kong's core values and the Hong Kong way of life. So right. the the Hong Kong government's tear gassing and beating of peaceful protesters on September 28th was seen as excessive violence 
and the earlier National People's Congress Standing Committee's decision to basically rule out universal suffrage as it had been expected for the last 30 years right. is basically considered a stolen future election. Okay. Now, so. a, lot, a lot of people listening you know, may not be closely attuned to the political status of Hong Kong. Of course, Hong Kong was a British colony and then was turned over to Chinese rule. Uh, why didn't the British implement universal suffrage in Hong Kong? I mean, it's not like the Chinese government suppressed elections that were already occurring, was it? Well, there was a, a variety of issues in play. Uh, the Chinese government uh, was a major factor in the British's decision not to introduce universal suffrage uh, because the, the feeling during colonial times is that the, the Chinese Communist Party would not tolerate it. Okay. Uh, at the same time, having a more democratic system in a colonial environment met a lot of opposition from certain colonials. But there was certain efforts to make the system more democratic, uh, especially after the post-war period. Which was, which was when? Uh, World War II. Oh, I'm so sorry, oh, post-war. So, yeah. Okay, yeah, so sorry. After the Al Allies liberated Hong Kong and Hong Kong was uh, handed right. back to the British after the Japanese occupation, uh, there was moves to make things more democratic. Right. And then, of course, um, in the um, middle 1980s, uh, after China and the United, United Kingdom began talking about the return of Hong Kong, uh, the colonial government and the British government began to introduce more democratic reforms at that time. And it was right. kind of sped up when um, Governor Chris Patton went there uh, towards the end game in the early 90s. So. Right. Now, no, it was, if I remember right, it was 1997 when Hong Kong was handed over? Yes, uh, okay. July 1st, 1997. So why, why 20 years later are, are we suddenly talking about democracy in Hong Kong? Uh, I, I mean, why did the, uh, these social movements break out when they did, which I guess was 2014, 2015? Was that the beginning of the... Well, there's a well. Yes, well. So let me kind of break it down a little bit. Okay. First, contrary to most popular opinion, democracy as such was never really promised to Hong Kong. They were okay. promised universal suffrage. Uh, they have liberal Western rights, uh, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of religion, and so forth like that. Uh, they had limited democracy, but Hong Kong, uh, the China government had always imposed this requirement that the leading mainstay of Hong Kongers would have to be quote unquote patriots, okay. people that were acceptable to the Chinese Communist Party. Meaning Chinese now, patriots, not Hong Kong for patriots. for the Legislative Council, yeah. uh, and then later for the chief executive. But even during the 80s, as the pro-democracy movement started in, in the 80s, almost at, about the same time that the Sino-British negotiations over the return of Hong Kong started. Uh, so the democracy movement has been there now, what we're looking at, um, uh, 30, 40 years. Um, okay. And this is one of the things that is, is what we have, basically what I argue in my, my PhD thesis, that Hong Kong is a deeply divided society, uh, also traumatized by certain things in its past. But this deep division uh, between pro-democracy and pro-communist or pro-establishment uh, is one of these fault lines. Now this, over the, since 2012, in the uh, the coming of age of the Hong Kong generation, those born shortly before or thereabouts 1997, uh, you have a generational shift. So uh, there's different expectations of what democracy or universal suffrage, different expectations of what the Hong Kong way of life uh, and what Hong Kong's future should be. Uh, this has been a major division. So this is where one of the divisions between the Occupy Central people and then the Umbrella Movement or the Umbrella Revolution people, uh, who tends to be younger and um, less collaborationist and less willing to trade away their liberal freedoms uh, uh -huh. for prosperity. Because quite frankly, uh, the, pro the tycoons in Hong Kong and the elite have benefited over the last uh, 20 years but the middle class and the grassroots have not. Okay. The Gini uh, coefficient was already in the 0.50, almost 0.50 range 
at 1997 and has gone up since then. So that's um, a measure of inequality, which is all high and rising. Yes, yes. Okay. So, and because Hong Kong has switched to a service-based economy, um, a lot of the jobs that people have, even though they're university educated, they cannot afford to live alone. So they live in very small flats. Right. Their prospects are very um, uh, much more limited as compared to what was considered in the hot and heavy 80s and 90s when Hong Kong was booming and, and China was just beginning to come out of the Cultural Revolution. So right, but, one uh -huh. of the things that is a distinguishing factor is between some of the young student leaders in the umbrella movement is they will often remark that the old school pan-democrats, the old school democratic camp, uh, they have foreign passports, they're well off, uh, they can leave Hong Kong if it goes bad. Right. But the newest generation of Hong Kongers, they had no choice. Hong Kong is their home. There's right. no place else for them to go. So they have to fight for their home. And so they're not Hong Kong and British thing. or Hong Kong and Canadian. These are kids who are Hong Kongers and in effect Hong yes. Kong and Chinese, whether they like it well, or not. Well, it depends. What you are arguably seeing, although it's a very controversial um, uh, issue, is you're seeing yeah. the emergence of a new ethnicity. And now roughly or crudely, this is manifested in these um, protest claims of Hong Konger, not Chinese. Okay. Because the relationship between Hong Kong and China has deteriorated so bad that uh, while some may identify as being Chinese, they don't identify as that type of Chinese, which is usually a reference to okay. the nouveau rich or the communists. Okay. So there's a lot of identity politics involved. And my thesis basically argues that part of the conflict between China and Hong Kong is between the political security of the Chinese Communist Party and the social tile security of Hong Kong. Okay. So in this, this the division on the social tile security, the old school pan Democrats see themselves as Chinese. Okay. The, new, the new guys and girls, not so much. All right. Now we have some of your photos. Uh, I should tell our listeners that, you know, in addition to being a you know, a sociologist, a political scientist, a former intelligence analyst. You're also quite an accomplished photographer, and you've published several books of photography, and your photography also has been uh, picked up by uh, newspapers and magazines and websites. Uh, let me show the first of the photos you sent to me, and let, give me a moment to get that uh, in position so people can see it uh, and still see our faces. And uh, what we're looking at seems to me to just be a post of some kind with some numbers on it uh, and a sticker. Can you tell me what we're looking at? Yeah, what that one is, uh, give me up a second here so I can read it off to you. Uh, so this, so yes, I, I use photographic methods or visual methods in a lot of my research. So I document the urban infrastructure, which includes graffiti, political stickers, uh, anything that may be indicators of social tensions, fault lines, and so forth. Right. So this particular sticker, uh, which reads, freedom is in pearl, defend it with all your might. This is kind of a, uh, a signifier of what the pro-democracy or the pro-Hong Kong camp feel about Hong Kong being under threat, its freedoms. Right. Now this particular sticker, has been in this location, which I won't reveal the exact location, um, but it's on Hong Kong Island, it has been there for several years now. So whereas some of the other stickers and graffitis will be removed or, or painted over or plastered over, sometimes with pro-Beijing stickers right. uh, or graffiti, uh, this one has been kind of there. It's kind of innocuous, but it's been there for a long time. And But this sentiment, freedom is in peril, defend it with all your might, is a concept that you see in many of the protest visuals that people use, and you also see it online, where I also do a lot of my um, participant observation research online. Right. Now, you suggest that these stickers are being taken down or painted over. I mean, who's taking down these stickers? Well, it's because there's signposts and so forth like that, and most a lot of these signposts um, um, have the warning, post no bill. So, but considered, right. you know, an, an eyesore. So you have cleaners that normally would take them down as part 
of their uh, duties. However, what's interesting is sometimes you can see certain stickers that remain there, but the other stickers surrounding it are removed. So one might surmise that whatever cleaner is taking care of that particular area may sympathize with that oh, particular really? sticker. The it's... other thing is sometimes you will see, like I mentioned earlier, people pasting new stickers over on top of them. We see this with the pro Beijing group. So obviously this particular sticker with the kind of a colonial crest on it and the message is, is something from the pro-democracy camp or the pro-Hong Kong camp. Sometimes you'll see the pro Beijing camp, they'll come by and they'll put stickers over it, uh, which are generally uh, a lot more negative, shall we say. Right. Uh, and sometimes they will scratch parts of it out. And even within the pro Hong Kong camp, because you have these divisions uh, uh, within the in that movement, you may have another group of the pro democracy camp that come in and put their own sticker over it. So, like the so called localists, the people that sometimes support uh, independence for Hong Kong, or they, they support a higher a higher degree of autonomy for Hong Kong, but they're basically Hong Konger. Uh, they may cross out certain parts of the pro-democracy movement oh, okay. stickers because they kind of disagree with it, especially like around the June 4th uh, observation that the candlelight vigil, because some of the stickers um, for those, or the posters for those celebrations are seen as uh, trying to convince Hong Kongers to be Chinese and then also concerned about what is happening on Chinese. And the new localist camp quite often have no connection at all with China. They don't care what happens with it. All so right. you, you may have some inter, um, inter pro Hong Kong democracy camp, you know, covering uh, of each other's principles. Right. Then of course, like as I mentioned earlier, they're considered eyesore, so they are remo right. removed. I, and then of I, course I, you have weather, yeah. you know, weather. Of but course. some of them, like even with the umbrella movement, uh, that I, I follow a site uh, pattern. Uh, have been there for three or four years after the, um, it's almost four years at the, after the end of Umbrella. There are still signs in Hong Kong streets uh, from the Umbrella movement. Right. Um, although the Hong Kong government has tried very hard to erase them all. Right. I, I find it really interesting, this idea that there's a whole political battle or debate of symbols going on that if I went to Hong Kong as a tourist, I might be completely unaware that this political debate is occurring in the public space all around me. <laughs> but, you know, you and someone who studies it or someone who's native to Hong Kong would be fully aware of the politics going on. In well, yeah, some, some of the people would be yeah. fully aware, but some of these stickers are very uh, cleverly designed. Um, like you've had some anti-mainland stickers referring to mainland tourists as locusts, bugs okay. that have actually been positioned on the... Um, the button for to cross the street. And they look like the original uh, sticker that would be on there, unless you look very closely. Uh. <clears throat> and same thing on the uh, public transportation. Uh, some of the more uh, uh, transgressive um, activists have replaced some of those stickers also on there too. So a right. lot of Hong Kong, a lot of this because it's part of the urban infrastructure Unless you're really looking for it and right. you really understand what you're looking at, you may not know. But this is one of the methodologies, kind of a Flanor type of methodology, where you learn about the city by walking the city. So this is one of the things I did during the whole time of the, the 79 days of the Umbrella Revolution, right. going out there every day, photographing, observing. And quite often, I would walk for a couple miles, taking pictures, monitoring, quote unquote, monitoring which stickers did remain and which ones disappeared. Wow. I'm putting up our your second photo, which is a, a photo of a sign that says fall of Hong Kong since 1997 and a lot of people milling around it. Can you tell us about that photo? Yes. So this photo was from the July 1st March last year in 2017. Okay. And what they are talking about basically is the popular perception that one country, two systems has collapsed and Hong Kong has collapsed. Um, there's different reasons for it depending on people who you speak to, 
Um, but it, it's, especially among the younger crowd, this is, is very much a, a sentiment. Now, as I mentioned, this was in 2017. If we go back a little bit earlier, another sentiment that was originated from a popular television drama um, is called, the, the, you will see quotes from it called, the city is dying, you know. What they are talking about is the, the idea of Hong Kong is disappearing, um, that China is killing it, uh, that the integration with the mainland, that the over of a quarter billion Chinese tourists between 2003 and 2014 and 2015 is kind of doing kind of a culture of obliteration. And then you had the Hong Kong government's efforts to uh, push Mandarin uh, into uh, marginalized Cantonese, uh, to push patriotic education, uh, some retail stores in Hong Kong, uh, instead of using traditional Chinese characters like they use in Hong Kong, right. they start using simplified characters. So, so can I stop and you so, there? Can so I ask you, I'm gonna put up that photo again. Uh, can I ask you to tell people about, you, you know, for most of us, Chinese is Chinese. We don't know about Mandarin Cantonese. We don't know about uh, simplified versus uh, traditional characters. Can you just give us a little background on that and why that represents the fall of Hong Kong? Well, I can give a, a brief background. I'm not a yeah, yeah just a <laughs> little explanation. On, but yes, so ch Chinese is a language that has been around for uh, a thousand years, and the term Chinese as a language is 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 kind of broad and, and somewhat controversial. Typically, today, Hong Tung Wa or Mandarin is considered the Chinese language. But then you have these, what they call Chinese dialects, like uh, Cantonese, Shanghainese, and several others. But these particular dialects, they have 70, 80, 100 million people that speak them. Okay. So uh, orally, if you were, if you and I were to speak, you spoke Shanghainese and I spoke Pung uh, Wa, we would not necessarily be able to understand each other. So, so it's we like, have a common writing system between right. the two of us. So it's kind of like now, medieval Europe when like one person might speak French, another Italian, but they could both communicate in Latin. Exactly, exactly. So Pung Tung Wa is the Chinese Communist Party's um, policy to have everybody be able to speak Pung Tung Wa. Government officials are required to speak it uh, okay. in order, you know, for like the Roman Empire. Somebody has to speak a common language. Right. Now, traditional Chinese has tens of thousands of characters, if not hundreds of thousands, if you count the archaic ones. Um, and they're very complicated. So in about 1953 to 1950s, the Chinese government began to simplify uh, the Chinese text, the calligraphy, uh, in yeah. order to make it more manageable and easier. Because around the time of the Communist Revolution, 1949, about 80% of China was illiterate. So now this has reversed. And on the mainland, they pushed or they, they use simplified characters. And then in Hong Kong and some of the other overseas Chinese communities, they use traditional. Now, you can read some of them together, but some of them you cannot because okay. they're, they're not possible. So this, so in Hong Kong, when a business begins to use simplified characters that your local Hong Kongers don't understand, they begin to feel isolated in their own place. Really? It's like in different communities around the world where you have a large immigrant population People start ap appealing to that particular immigrant group, and then the locals begin to feel, you know, kind of pushed out to the right. side. So I can have gone. Well, now, I, I can understand that because mm. no, uh, yeah. I'll just agree real quick. Is that uh, because the Chinese tourist dollar is very strong in Hong Kong? Some of your higher end luxury stores have instituted policies, not only using simplified Chinese, but catering only to mainland Chinese, okay. to the detriment of the local Hong Kongers. This is why a lot of the problems around 2012 began to erupt. So, so as an outsider, if I hear simplified, you know, my, my, my assumption was that although a mainland Chinese person might not be able to read traditional characters, I assume that if someone could read traditional characters, of course they'd also be able to read simplified characters. Is that not the case? Is it not that straightforward? Well, I, I think it's not, I think maybe for some characters you can, but not okay. necessarily all of them. It, okay. it depends probably on how literate the individual okay. is. And, and as government in Hong Kong, if I went to a government meeting, would it be conducted 
in Mandarin, in Cantonese, or, or in English? Well, Chinese undefined uh, and English are two official languages of the Hong Kong government. Uh, in the past, a Ch Chinese undefined is Cantonese. a language. Yeah. Well, no. Well, they say Chinese. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. it doesn't specify what kind. Cantonese or or Puntung Wat. Ah, okay. Now, with beginning around 2012, with the administration of Cy Leung, uh, the push in the Hong Kong government to use Puntung Wat Mandarin became much more prominent. Uh, Cy gave his acceptance speech when he was appointed in Mandarin. And you start seeing more and more used by Mandarin, and beginning to see less and less used by English uh, of English, in documents and and in um, oral presentations. So it used to be that the Hong Kong government would publish a lot of its official documents in English, and more recently, over the last couple of years, that has slowed down or, or stopped altogether. They may provide a summary, but they won't provide a whole English translation. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. I've just put up your third photo, and uh, before I introduce it, I'll also say that I've opened up the call-in line. So uh, we have a Skype line. It is, you can't see the stand, but as people watching can see, we're on Skype S. Babonis or a U.S. call-in line on 412-567-6798, and an Australian call-in line on 02-8003-6853. We'd love to hear from anyone who wants to call in. I can't guarantee the technology will work. But we'll hope it will if you give us a try. Um, in the meantime, we're going to keep talking. Don't let that stop you. Don't be polite and wait for us to stop talking before you call in, or we'll never hear from you because I don't have a producer who can separately take phone calls. So if you want to call and you're out there listening, go ahead and call. We'll stop and take your call when we hear from you. But until then, uh, I have this photo up, this very provocative photo of a naked person. I think it's a man. I'm not sure. Uh, with Hong Kong is written in front in English and then some Chinese characters in the background underneath. Can you tell us about this photo? <clears throat> yes. So this photograph was taken uh, last year um, on June 4th. And it is one of the performance art um, installations that you can often find during June 4th and 1 July. Right. This and why, why June 4th? Is well, June 4th is the anniversary of the Tiananmen Massacre. Mm -hmm. um, and in Hong Kong, when the student movement in China was occurring, it had a lot of support from Hong Kongers. And moral support, Hong, Hong Kongers were really enrolled in the promise of a democratic China. Right. And then when the Chinese Communist Party destroyed the movement in Tiananmen Square, um, Hong Kongers were very traumatized by this. Okay. In fact, Two of the largest protests in colonial Hong Kong history were before and after the June 4th incident. And this was June 4th, so, 1987, if I remember right? 1989. 1989, I'm sorry. June 4th, 1989, yeah. the Tiananmen Square massacre in Beijing, but which also yes. had large protests in Hong Kong. And this is a commemoration of that? Yes, it's, a, it's what we call a candlelight vigil. So they mem uh, memorialized uh, the victims of the Chinese Communist Party. They call for justice. They call for the Chinese Communist Party to rectify its position on the movement as a counter-revolutionary movement. Um, and you have other claims in there also for democracy on China and so forth like this. But the core of the movement is for justice uh, for the Tiananmen victims, their mothers. You have the Tiananmen mothers also involved. And <clears throat> excuse me. Even though the focus of the world was on Tiananmen Square in Beijing, the Chinese Communist Party in the PLA cracked down on the student movement in other cities as well okay. throughout China. So this is often forgotten. Uh, and that, at the time in 1989, after the crackdown. Hong Kong was also involved in helping to smuggle out some of the leading student dissidents underneath what they call the Yellowbird Action. So about 100 Tiananmen activists were smuggled out from China to the West, uh, Taiwan, Japan, uh, other places around the world. Right. And a lot of the old school pan-Democrats today were involved in that activity. 
so this is part of their very much part of their identity and this is one of the major fracture areas between the old school pan democrats and the new hong kongers right uh, where as i mentioned earlier the new hong kongers see a team in square uh and china as as something totally separate from them okay. they didn't live through that trauma man i was in japan at that time and i remember watching it as it played out on, on television uh in japan uh you know about four not four hours flight away so but a lot of these young people you know they have no connection to this history so on june 4th and act actually the events surrounding the june 4th candlelight vigil actually take place in the weeks beforehand also sometimes you'll have marathons you'll have protests calling for the release of political prisoners some of them still connected to the June 4th, uh, some of them more recent. Um, and then a lot that night on the June 4th, you will have a lot of campaigns by the different political right. parties and home pro-democracy political parties, right. um, trying to raise funds, uh, selling t-shirts, uh, selling uh, uh, booklets about it. And then everybody goes to Victoria Park to have the kind of like uh, the vigil. Okay. But this picture here is out in Causeway Bay, which is adjacent to the park. And we still have the, these performances out there. Right. And we should tell people this uh, is like a major shopping mall market. area. It's not some, it's, it's yes, a huge, yes. brightly lit shopping mall. Yeah. What, yes. The person is naked. So this gentleman, no, actually he's wearing a loincloth. Okay. Uh, a flesh colored loincloth. Uh, so this gentleman, uh, a performance artist, and unfortunately, I don't know his name. Right. Um, is talking about, as I understand the installation, you know, is talking about what what will Hong Kong do? Now, there's actually two signs there. Uh, there's the black one behind him, uh, and then there's a blue one. Now, this okay. blue one that says Hong Kong is right is actually folded in half. When you unfold it, it says Hong Kong is not China. Oh. Now, this was a major. Uh, issue that came out in, um, as I mentioned earlier, about the Hong Kong or right. Chinese ethnicity that has emerged, but it also became a major political confrontation in 2016 uh, during the swearing in of certain legislative council members, and because it was seen as a declaration right. of Hong Kong independence. Now, and so everyone seeing this would know that that's the rest of the phrase. Yes, yeah. most likely. Oh, definitely anybody that is politically right. um, active uh, or literate, and definitely right. on the pro Beijing side. Um, right. So, and, it, and um, what is the black sign with the characters, the white characters? I would have to look at my other pictures. Uh, next next year, uh, I think it's asking about next year, will Hong Kong be like China, if okay. I remember correctly. I would have to go back and look at the, the larger photograph, sure. because this is actually one in a series of about 60 photographs. Oh, okay. Because after he did this, this is actually towards the end of one phase of the performance. Uh, before that, he had some dancing, he had a t-shirt on, which is now stained with red wine, but that's to signify blood. Right. Uh, after this particular ep um, phase of the uh, performance, he actually gets up with the candles and he walks down the street to the Victoria Park and tries to enter, but is blocked by Hong Kong police. And he has this small confrontation with Hong Kong police. And um, then he returns back. Uh, but this particular installation and some of the others is kind of a, sig a signifier of the despair and the um, uh, I would not say nihilism, but despair and frustration and concern um, okay. over the loss of Hong Kong. Now, we have to start wrapping up, but uh, can people buy your photography? Uh, you have a, a photography book out that... Uh... Well, I only have one book out, and it's on the um, uh, protest culture in Hong Kong. Okay. Um, and it stops about July 2014, and basically covers, for the most part, 2011 to 2014, although there are some pictures uh, from years earlier and I had visited. 
Right. Um, I'm working on some new other ones. Uh, that particular book on the protest culture uh, is available through Springer. Right. What's um, it called? It has a very lengthy title. Oh. Counter Hegemonic Resistance <laughs> in China's Hong Kong Visualizing Protests in the City. <laughs> but it does have photos, now, I'm right? I'm actually working. Yeah. It has about 500 photographs, black and white. 500. Um, yes. Right. So this and basically. We'll now, Hong Kong is normally known as a city of protest, and typically it's assumed that all those protests are pro-democracy protests, but that's not accurate. Hong Kong has a lot of social justice, gender, and solidarity protests. So the book actually captures uh, LGBT protests, uh, covers solidarity with um, the uh, uh, bombing and like uh, uh, against the bombing in uh, Syria or Libya. Right. You had the uh, about 3,000 uh, Hong Kongers uh, who are not of Chinese ethnicity, but right. who are Hong Kongers that were protesting the Muhammad cartoons. Um, and you have a lot of uh, protests against U.S. Uh, and other imp imperialist type uh -huh. movements. So uh -huh. a lot of democracy is a large part of the movement, but you have a lot. Of, you have a lot of other protests. Now the second book I'm working on right now is dealing with how the Chinese and Hong Kong government have essentially broken the back of the protest movement in Hong Kong right. following the Umbrella Revolution. Because beforehand, there was no cost to protesting in Hong Kong. You weren't going to be discriminated against. You weren't going to be fired. You weren't going to be locked up. They were not bought. Right. But after 2014, when the Hong Kong police began militarizing their protest policing, and you have these patriotic vigilante groups that attack some people, uh, and the Hong Kong government began taking people's names from their ID cards. Right. People started losing their jobs, being uh, on social media, being basically uh, human flesh search engines. Um, you know, now people are less inclined to go out to support a movement because it's very risky now. All right. Look, Dan Garrett, thanks for joining me. I'll put a link to your Springer book in the comments of this YouTube video. And uh, I really appreciate your taking the time to, uh, to talk to us tonight. Okay, thank you very much. And I would just say, if they want to see some of my pictures, I'm a contributor to the Hong Kong Free Press. So you can find a lot of my other pictures there. Oh, great, I'll, I'll also put a link to that in the comment section. So thanks, Dan, great. and everyone else, please join us next week for Midnight in America.